fiery horse for the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Hyo Silver, the Lone Ranger. With his faithful Indian companion, Tato, the daring and resourceful mask rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fellow. Hail Silver. Away! The soldiers at Fort Lancaster, located close to the east bank of the Pecos River, were drawn up in formation on the parade ground. Attention! In front of and facing the company, young Sergeant Barnett stood between two guards. The commanding officer of the fort, Colonel Emmett, standing a few paces from the sergeant, read from an official-looking paper. At a court-martial composed of qualified officers of the United States Army, Sergeant Jeffers Barnett has been found guilty of disorderly conduct, insubordination, and striking an officer. The penalty for his conduct, as decided by the court-martial, is dishonorable discharge from the service to take effect immediately. As the soldiers and the prisoner stood stiffly at attention, the colonel removed the insignia and brass buttons from the sergeant's uniform. That's all, Mr. Barnett. You're free to go. Yes, sir. Captain, dismiss the company. Yes, miss! We, Barnett, before you leave the fort, I'd like to see you in my office. Yes, sir. A short time later, Jeff Barnett, in civilian clothes, was ushered into the colonel's office and stood without speaking until the corporal had left. Sit down, Barnett. Uh, thank you, Colonel. <laughs> well, my boy, you went through that ordeal so convincingly that nobody can question the authenticity of the proceedings. Now, we... I suggest you drift from town to town, frequent the cafes, and express your bitterness toward me and toward the army. Well, I'll really have to force myself to do that, sir. It's necessary if our plan is to work, Sergeant. My one hope is that those responsible for the uprisings by the Indians west of here will get in touch with you. Now, it, once you join them and gain their confidence, we'll know what's going on. Well, how am I to contact? I've arranged that. A retired trooper, Jed Bagley, has a small farm across the river west of here. I've uh, already sent him several of our carrier pigeons. Oh, I see, sir. If I have a message for you, I take it to Bagley, and he releases one of the army pigeons with the message. Right. Uh, the pigeon will, of course, come straight here to the fort where his home coop is located. Oh, that's fine, sir. Well, I... I reckon I'm all set to leave now. I... Uh, I watched you a long time before I asked you to take this assignment, Sergeant. I admire your courage. 
I knew you would come through with flying killers. Thank you, Colonel. <laughs> I'll notify you if and when the men were after get in touch with me, sir. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, and good luck. Jeff left the fort and crossed the Pecos to the west. For over a week, he went into cafes in one small town after another in the territory. After pretending to drink too much, he expressed his bitterness against the commandant at Fort Lancaster and against the armory in general to anyone who would listen. One night, he was following his usual routine as he talked to the barkeep at the cafe in Milburg. Yeah. And like I said before, bartender, I'm going to get back at that polecat colonel at Fort Lancaster for having me thrown out of the service. Yeah, sure. Those officers think they're big pumpkins. And that goes for every one of them that's in the army, as far as I'm concerned. Here, yeah, fill it up. You haven't paid for the last one yet, mister. Uh, I do. Here, barkeep. Huh? Take it out of that. Then bring his glass back to the table in the corner. Right. Well, what's the idea? Who are you? Oh, well, just a friend, mister. My pals know me as Handy. <laughs> handy, eh? Huh? Well, you sure came in handy right now. Just about broke. Well, maybe you aren't going to be for long. Come on back and sit down. A friend of mine wants to talk to you. What about? Look, it's not going to hurt you to come and find out. Well, all right. Well, sit down and meet Leo, a friend of mine. Hi, Leo. I'm Jeff Barnett, formerly Sergeant Barnett. Well, howdy. Used to be in the Army, eh? Seems you have a grudge against it now from the way we heard you talking. You or anyone else don't like what I say about the Army. It's <laughs> too... Now, hold on, Jeff. Maybe I agree with you. Who knows? Handy, too, huh, Handy? Yeah, maybe we do. Now, look. He said you wanted to talk to me. What do you got to say? I figured maybe if you met our boss and he thinks you're all right, you might be able to make some money and get back at that colonel. Both at the same time. You interested? Well, uh, I'll go with you and see what he has to say. All right. Come on. Later that night, Tonto, Indian companion to the Lone Ranger, rode from town to their camp in the nearby hills. Tonto, who had been standing in the cafe, told the masked man about Jeff's loud and bitter talk. I heard of a Sergeant Barnett who was dishonorably discharged from the Army at Fort Lancaster last week. He must have been the one you heard talking in the cafe, Tonto. Maybe that right. Was the man from the table a friend? No, him not friend. Him stranger to Army fellow. I'm certain it must have been Barnett. And if he's as bitter as you say, he's ready to listen to most anyone. That right. The men we're trying to find who are inciting the Indian uprisings would be glad to get a fellow like Barnett to join them. Me not savvy. Well, if he's bitter enough, Sergeant Barnett could tell them the weaknesses of Fort Lancaster as well as Army strength and movements in this territory. Oh. And you think fellas in Cape who get Army men to leave with them, ones who deal with renegades... It's possible. We'll move camp to the edge of town in the morning, Tonto. We'll watch for that young sergeant. If you see him riding from town, we'll follow him. May lead to something. Meantime, the two men, Handy and Leo, took Jeff to a deserted miner's shack in a remote hollow. He was introduced to their boss, Gil Kane, a large, tough man with dark, piercing eyes. Handy explained why they'd brought Jeff there. Gill turned an unfriendly stare upon Jeff as he asked. How do I know you're not just putting on an act, Barnett? Act? What do you mean? Maybe you got a line on Handy and Leo somehow. Then when you saw them in the cafe, you started that loud crazy talk so as to get him to bring you here. Now what's he yapping about, Handy? You brought me out here to listen to a lot of loco stuff like that. I might as well go back to the cafe. More oh, fun there, anyway. Oh, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Jeff. Sit down. I... All right, all right. But if he thinks I'm going to listen... Take it to... easy. Let me do the talking. Now, listen, Gil. I heard this fellow doing the same kind of talking in Sandrock. And I know he didn't see me. Now, tonight in town, Leo and I were sitting back in the corner. He didn't even look our way when he came in and started talking to the bartender. That's right, Gil. Well, after what Handy just said, I reckon I was wrong, Barnett. Now you're acting human, Kane. 
Now, tell me how I make that cash and get back at that no-good colonel at Fort Lancaster. All right, listen. How many soldiers are at Fort Lancaster? About 200. How many at Fort Mill, 20 miles to the south? Uh, I reckon about the same number. Uh-huh. There are about 800 Indians spread out in small villages among the hills on the other side of the river. They're ready to combine. Uh, what for? They want the valley across the river. They figure if they could get control of those two forts, they'd be able to take over the valley. But even if they did, the army would move in later and drive them out again. <laughs> That's not my worry. Chief Big Owl has promised that we could have all the cash, horses, rifles, and ammunition if we help them grab the forts. And I could get rid of this stuff quick south of the border. 800 savages ought to be able to take a fort manned by just 200 men. Yeah, provided they didn't get wind of which fort was going to be attacked and brought in reinforcements from the other. In that case, the Indians would be up against 400 well-trained riflemen. That's right. When do you plan to make your first move? In a couple of days. Which fort will they go after first? I'll decide that tomorrow. We'll talk some more in the morning, and you can give me details of Fort Lancaster. I reckon we better turn in now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll get back to town and come out in the morning. I, I figure I can find a way now. You better stay here tonight. Uh, no, I... Uh, well, I, I have a room at the hotel I have to settle for. I might as well go there to sleep. All right, go ahead then. See you in the morning. And remember, keep your mouth shut. Sure thing. Good night. Good, Good night, night, Jeff. Trail them handy, and don't let them out of your sight. Right. Well, there he goes. I'll watch him, Gil. Don't worry. At dawn, the Lone Ranger and Tonto stopped in the thick grove on the edge of town. Oh, easy, 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 We'll camp here and keep our eyes open for Barnett. You sure you'll recognize him, Tonto? Uh, me sure. Half an hour later, the two men heard hoofbeats pounding on the trail beyond the grove. Kimasabi. That young fella, Barnett. Him riding hard from town. We'll saddle the horses and follow his trail. Lone Ranger and Tonto quickly saddled Silver and Scout. And as they were about to mount, they heard other hooves passing on the trail. Him ride plenty fast, too. And me sure, him one of men who talked to Barnett in cafe. He must be trailing Barnett. Let's go. Easy, 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 easy fella. Come on, Silver. Get him up. Oh. Unknown to the others, Jeff was heading for the farm on the West Trail, where the pigeons from Fort Lancaster were kept. Andy, who was trailing him, knew the gang leader Gill was suspicious of the young sergeant. Finally, Jeff's hoof marks turned onto a branch trail that led to the farm. Andy rode in the same direction. The trail became hard and rocky, and when he caught a glimpse of the farm buildings through the trees, oh, 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 steady. he dismounted behind some boulders alongside the trail. He was preparing to go forward cautiously on foot, when he heard other hoofbeats approaching. Uh, somebody else taking the branch trail to that farm. I'll keep out of sight behind these boulders till they go past. A few minutes later, the Lone Ranger and Tonto rode past. Hard, rocky ground, not sure hoofmark. Look, there are farm buildings. That must be where they were heading. Keep out of sight and try to find out what's going on. Come on, Silver. Hey, a couple of old hoots. They must be following Barnett and me. They don't know it, but they're liable to wind up full of lead. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments.
to continue. After the Lone Ranger and Toto had gone past his hiding place, the crook handy went forward on foot. Not knowing they'd been observed, the Lone Ranger and Toto stopped in a grove of trees near the farm. Oh, 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 easy, 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 easy. I don't see their horses, but that branch trail ends here at this farm. We'll move carefully toward the house and see what's happening. Ah, oh, that good idea. The masked man and the Indian approached the farmhouse from the side through the tall brush. Suddenly, they crouched down and watched as men came out the back door. Two men are going from our house to the small barn. Ah, uh, one of them, Barnett feller. They continued to watch as the farm owner climbed wooden steps to the pigeon loft, then came down carrying a pigeon. For a few minutes, he and Jeff Barnett stood with a bird. Them tie something to leg a pigeon. That must be a carrier pigeon. Look, they let it go. I don't know what it's all about, but we'll wait and continue to follow Barnett. Meantime, the gunman Handy was hiding close to the barn. He, too, had seen the pigeon leave, and he was close enough to hear Jeff remark. Yeah, there he goes. Shouldn't take him long to reach Fort Lancaster. I'll get back now, but I'll come to see you again soon. All right, Chuck. Hey, I'll go get my horse. Then take a short cut to the shack and tell Gil what I saw and heard. I better tell him about those two owl hoots I saw, too. Maybe he can figure out why they were trailing us. <laughs> Later, Handy entered the shack and reported to Gill. And Barnett's a sneaking double crosser. He must have sent word to Fort Lancaster by that carrier pigeon. We ought to plug him when he comes back. If he does come back. Oh, you'll show up, don't worry. You want to get more information. What about the two owl hoots I saw? I know they were trailing either Barnett or me to that farm. Hell, if you covered your trail from the farm to here, that puts us in the clear. If they was following you. In case they followed Barnett and trailed him here. We'll just take care of that masked man and his partner. What you gonna do about Barnett? I'll give him some information and let him go send it. I see a way to make this thing turn in our favor. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, it must be him now. Hi. Well, I found a way back here, all right. All right. We came to a decision during the night. We're riding over to tell Big Owl to get his Indians ready to attack Fort Mill at dawn tomorrow. 20 miles from here. If Fort Lancaster learns about it, they'll send reinforcements down there. Don't you think so? Yeah, that's right. Well, there's no way for him to know it. Now, you stay here, Barnett. We'll be gone about two hours. Then when I get back, I'll tell you the details. All right. Come on, Andy. Leo, let's go. Right, right. Leo. The Lone Ranger and Tonto had followed Jeff to the shack. They had watched from hiding as the three crooks rode away. And then, waiting until they saw Jeff come out, they mounted and followed him back to the pigeon farm. Once more, they watched as a pigeon was released with a message. Meantime, Gil and the other two had ridden a short distance from the shack and then stopped. Oh, there, oh, 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 there. Oh, there. Look, Gil, what's up? Are we really going to see Big Owl and tell him about attacking Fort Mill? <laughs> we'll see him later today. And tell him to attack Fort Lancaster. But you told Barnett. Sure, sure. Now, we know Barnett's using those carrier pigeons to communicate with Fort Lancaster. He's sending word that the Indians are going to attack Fort Mill. So, soldiers will march tonight for Fort Mill. Then, at dawn tomorrow, the Indians will really attack Lancaster. Which isn't going to have but a few men left to defend it. <laughs> That's smart figuring, Gil. Sure it is. Now we'll turn back and wait in the gully beside the trail to Dry Gulch Barnett when he rides back from the farm. Let's go. Yeah, come on, get, get up there. Once more, Jeff left the farm after sending the second message. The Lone Ranger and Tonto rode the trail toward the shack a short distance behind him. Hello, I'm beginning to think we've found the men we've been hunting. If we can get proof that they are, we'll... Here, shots. Them come from ahead. Come on, Silver. Get them up, scout. As the masked man and Indian rode over a rise, they saw Jeff Barnett lying on the trail. His horse stood nearby with trailing reins. Oh, 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 o
him, not dead. They must have scared off those who shot him. Oh. <laughs> they found out, I reckon. <laughs> that mask. Easy, fella, easy. Toto, get the first aid kit. We'll bandage his wound, then camp temporarily over there in that grove. Uh -huh. The Lone Ranger and Toto attended to Jeff's wounds. They made him comfortable in the grove. And soon Jeff indicated he wanted to talk. Oh, that mask, I, I still don't savvy, but after you helped me like you did, I reckon it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, Barnett. But there are other things that do. Your trips to that farm, the pigeons, those other men. Oh, I, I gave my word not, not to talk about it. But I, I may be dying if, if there was someone I could trust. Here, look at this, Jeff. This is a silver bullet. Does it mean anything to you at all? Sil silver bullet? Yes, I... At the Ford, I heard of a... A masked man who... Uh, you... You must be the Lone That's Ranger. right. We heard about your discharge, and we know you joined that gang. I don't know what's going I on, I know I can I... trust you. And... Well, I... I'm not what you might think, mister... Let me tell you everything before I die. And, and if I don't die, well, I failed anyway. Briefly, Jeff told about the colonel's plan. How he agreed to be dishonorably discharged from the army. And of his hopes that he could finally join Gill's gang. He told all that he'd learned and explained about the carrier pigeons. Then the Lone Ranger remarked. You're a brave, patriotic soldier, Jeff. But I... I failed. No, I... you succeeded. You found the men responsible for the uprisings. I'm sure you'll get well, Jeff. We'll take you back to the farm where you'll be comfortable. We'll send another message telling the colonel the Indian's plans and suggesting that he send word to Fort Mill. Yes. Commandant there will move his cavalry across the river and northward. Then if the Fort Lancaster cavalry come across at this point, the two forces can move on the Indians from each end before they have a chance to fully organize. <laughs> After the final message was sent, Jeff was put to bed at the farmhouse to rest, while the Lone Ranger and Tonto went back to the shack, and from there followed the trail left by Gil, Handy, and Leo. Later, with their horses safely hidden nearby, the Lone Ranger and Tonto crouched among the brush on a bluff overlooking Chief Big Owl's village. As the afternoon wore on, there was much activity in the village. One small tribe after another entered the valley below and moved about in confusion. The masked man used field glasses. The three white men are doing their best to get the Indians organized, Toto. Ah, uh, me sure hope soldiers come soon. I do, too. Might be disastrous if all those Indians start moving southward and have a chance to meet the 200 men from Fort Mill. I'm counting on sort of a squeeze play by soldiers from both forts. But if they don't come soon, I... They've arrived. I see the men from Fort Mill riding in from the south. Ah, uh. And men from other port coming from north end. Come on, Toto. Easy, steady, big Easy, Scott. Easy, fella. Come on, Toto. Come on, When the Indians saw cavalry moving on them from the south, they immediately started fighting. But they were taken totally by surprise to find cavalry riding in from the opposite end of the narrow valley also. The Lone Ranger and Toto rode at breakneck speed to join the colonel and his forces and were soon in the midst of the fight. The masked man on the big white stallion seemed to be everywhere at once with blazing guns. Tonto, too, on the spirited paint scout, moved beside the Lone Ranger. As he yelled the war cry of his fathers and turned aside frenzied redskins with rapid gunfire. For some time the battle raged until the Indians, totally disorganized, thought only of escape finding no way to get past the well-armed soldiers guarding each end of the narrow valley and lacking sufficient firearms to resist the onslaught by the cavalry, the Indians, in spite of their greater number, finally gave up, and the battle ended. Later, in front of Chief Big Owl's wigwam, the Lone Ranger and Tonto were greeted by Colonel Emmons. I was told you and Tonto would come to this territory to help my friend. 
But I didn't know you were here until I received the message you sent by carrier pigeon earlier today. You're to be complimented, Colonel, on the way in which you acted so quickly. Another hour might have been too late. You spoke of them being responsible. Yes, you'll find three white men behind the chief's wigwam. All three dead by the hands of the Indians who thought they'd been betrayed. Big Al is a prisoner. The men are attending to the wounded, then we'll start the remaining Indians on the way to the reservation. Sergeant Barnett really brought all this about, Colonel. He's at the farm resting because of a bullet wound inflicted by one of the gang he joined. That boy will be mighty proud when he's rewarded for what he did. I recommended him for a promotion and for a medal award. Fine. I'll make it a point to be present when the award is made and the truth is told to his company. Tonto and I will go help with the wounded colonel. We'll see you again before we leave the territory, though. Adios, sir. Goodbye, my friend. Come up, scout. Colonel, what's all that about Barnett? Captain, he'll be Lieutenant Barnett soon and receive an award for his courageous act. His court-martial and disgrace were planned to help bring about what you saw today. Holy mackerel. I'm sure glad to hear it. But tell me, who was that masked man? Courage personified, Captain, and a fine American. He's the Lone Ranger. a feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated. Created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Muir Incorporated, directed by Charles D. Livingston, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of the Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer.